So, uh, first of all, welcome everyone to, um, well, and life itself kind of like thought cast, we could, we could call it, uh, where we're trying out sharing some of our developing ideas, things that we're seeing, things that we're reflecting on uh, in a dialogic format um, online. With me, I have our head of research, uh, Liam Kavanagh. I'm Rufus Pollock, one of the co-founders of Life Itself. And today we're going to talk about sustainable well-being and the politics of sustainable well-being and i'm going to act here as the socratic interlocutor to uh, to liam who's the leading leading this topic and leading our wiser policy forum series on the politics of sustainable well-being so liam do you want to start maybe by telling telling me and telling us a little bit about like what is sustainable well-being and what is the politics of sustainable well-being yeah Sure. Um, so, I mean, sustainable well-being is is in some way what's on the tin that sustainable or sustainability is this idea that we have, and we use it, we apply it to economics, that we have a kind of way of life and way of providing ourselves for ourselves and our needs, which is sustainable over time. But the well-being part is that, well, the focus of what we want to make sustainable is our subjective experience of life so how how good it is to be alive is sustainable and maybe expanding over time the idea there is as well that that we might may be able to expand how good it is to be alive over time uh even more so than it is now while being sustainable uh and the, the politics of sustainable well-being are, are really interesting because it's almost obvious, right, that sustainable well-being should be kind of an organizing principle of society, right? We obviously want to have good lives and we don't want the way that we produce those good lives to make our environment or our social system fall apart in such a way that the same kind of good lives aren't available to our future generation. But that isn't our organizing principle, and not only is it not the organizing principle of society, it isn't really the stated organizing principle of the environmental movement. You don't really get that really clearly when you walk into an, you know, an environmental rally. You don't really get that really clearly when you talk to people and well-being either, right? So despite the fact that these kinds of things are, uh, that a having having an offer of better lives, right? How great it is to be alive could expand while we're sustainable, that kind of offer, that kind of viewpoint, which I think is credible, should be really helpful to the environmental movement for having a positive message, uh, for sounding less like a kind of exercise um, who's willing to suffer the most uh, and, and more in, in terms of, well, how do we rediscover what really matters uh, and, and live for future generations uh, in, in such a way now uh, that we, we kind of set a tone, right, for the future, right? That isn't, that isn't coming across. And so there's a question then, like, well, why? Okay, right? so just, to just, but just, so just there, just to summarize it. So sustainable well-being is basically a principle or approach in, in a nutshell, it's very, now that we're familiar with sustainability, it's about a sustainable social economic system that, that I can go on producing what it's producing kind of materially wise into the future, maybe institutionally. And it's focused on well, kind of sustaining or growing well-being. And we want both, we want a level of well-being that's sustainable. Um, and it's, so it's this principle and approach to how we would organize society. That, and what you also said was, a, that should just be obviously, you know, kind of when you think about it, isn't that just obviously how we should organize society? And, and, um, and what you said is that may be so, but actually it isn't. That's why it's, it, it's, you know, coming up with a principle that's just everyone's already like, yeah, of course we're already doing that. But this principle, though obvious, isn't adopted and isn't even adopted necessarily by groups you would say who might be really in kind of in favor the environmental movement and so on so yeah so then the second point is i then get just to check the politics of sustainable well-being is 
is what the effort to make this a core, a key, a key part of policy is that, or, or exactly. as a way of addressing exactly. climate climate. Yeah. Well, oh yeah. Well, it's all of the, all of the, above. how do we address the, the climate crisis? Cause that is sustainable well-being, right? So addressing, addressing the climate crisis, if you're interested in sustainable well-being, then the first question is, well, we have a sustainability problem. And how, how do we use perspectives on well-being to address that sustainability problem? Part of the, the way of motivating people to be sustainable is to offer a vision that is better than the life they have now, yet sustainable. Uh, yeah. You know, and 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 that's a, the way you, one would build a coalition, right? Well, okay, we're all going to have better lives. Well our society as a whole is sustainable. That sounds good. <laughs> you know, let's make that happen. That's the way to put sustainability, you know, sustainable well-being in the center of, of society is to, to build a program based on the principle that people look at uh, and progressively over time gravitate towards uh, so that this becomes the, the organizing principle of society. And you know, the question of the dialogues has been, well, how do we get that started? And, and what does thing, it look like? And the thing is, though, is also a hot topic because in a way we have something not like, we have a very clear looming, I think to most people, looming climate crisis, uh, maybe not even looming, I'd say present, becoming present, very present. And the thing is, so the sustainable well-being approach could also be, you're kind of saying a way there seems to be a bit of a deadlock. Like we're not making the progress we'd like to policy wise. We seem, but so why is sustainable well being sort of not? I want to use the term solution. Why is it a? Why is this principle and approach possibly you useful in 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 taking action and 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 kind of driving political action around the climate crisis? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could you could look at it, right? So this first coalition building, right? That, okay, look, because the, the basic principle is, okay, we can have better lives, probably. There's a really good chance we'd have better lives while being sustainable. So thinking about, well, what does it look like to have better lives and being sustainable allows the beginning of a, of a formation of a platform. Now, a lot of the radicality that would be called for as part of that platform, we might not be ready for, uh, but uh, we can get started thinking about it and we can help the platform, uh, we can allow people to realize the severity of the, of the of challenge we face actually by emphasizing well-being, right? It's actually, possible i mean i i know all sorts of examples where living proof Thich Nhat Han admitted for example that you know humans might not be around in 100 years he's a pretty happy guy right uh, yet he he admits it and and many other people that i know that stuff oh we're not all Thich Nhat Han. you know i'm fairly happy day to day and i know lots of people who are fairly happy day to day at the same time that we accept social collapse is you know quite possible and allowing oneself the ability to admit that there's a real possibility that you know, we're going to have major instability socially at the same time we can be happy now i can hold that awareness and be joyful despite it um is a really powerful way of pushing the conversation forward so it's actually the, the skills of well-being are part of the ability that, that you need to accept the challenge that's set before us by the sustainability crisis and not and not and not fall into either either suppression i it's not going to happen it's all going to be fine um you know we're going to be saved with i don't know whatever or or kind of despair like you know so exactly okay so just so i'm just recapping myself so this is this sustainable well-being is this kind of vision or approach uh, in general to organize society. It's not as adopted. I mean, it's not front and center of, of the conversation. What I'm getting is it sort of moves us like why it's also a kind of interesting move then politically as a general approach is it's kind of 
it, it's one solution could be like we all just need to go wear our hair shirts we need you know the solution we can get sustainability but we're not going to get well-being you know like we're going to suffer you know we're going to sacrifice um and i'm not saying they're going to be well we're coming at the main materially sacrifice and i think that's a point you're getting at like so that's one aspect which keeps us locked in it you know well a load of people don't want that so we're not going to do anything another solution is that well we're not going to be sustainable <laughs> like let's just keep going the way we're going and it will be you know maybe it'll be all right on the night maybe somehow you know <laughs> that will capture this carbon um that's another place in it like you know probably unsustainable but good on the current well-being material well-being and i think you're going to come to is like part of the jiu-jitsu the sustainable well-being in, in our thinking for ourselves is to be like okay we mean something by well-being we're not saying sustainable growth we weren't we weren't saying sustainable growth here we were saying sustainable well-being so right. maybe you could say a bit more about why the term well-being because it moves into a different quadrant where we can have more well-being but maybe without maybe even without more material growth but without you know without without with a sustainability and that's like something that's a kind of sudden shit shout even today. less even a, a reduction in gdp i mean look you know if we all know the gdp chart right so you know for the viewer it kind of we're, we're going like this uh that you you get the majority of the the um, happiness or derive the majority of the happiness that we derive from our, our current income at say two thirds of it, uh, the vast majority, uh, for us to get another point on a, on a, you know, a 10 point scale of happiness, we, we have to have something like an average income of a million dollars per person because you need to essentially, it grows in a way that's called, it's logarithmic, basically happiness, the relationship between happiness and stuff is logarithmic. So we essentially need 10 times as much stuff we have now to get one more point uh, under the most charitable assumption about how much material stuff yeah. gives us. Some people dispute even that, but even the most, the people who have the, 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 the sort of most positive view about the, the contribution of material stuff to happiness would admit that we're basically, in order for us to go from 7.2 to 8.2, uh, as a society, we're talking about, say, the United States, we can have essentially almost, uh, I think it's, it's eight to 10 times the amount of stuff we have right now. Like that isn't going to happen, right? So we've, we've, at the early stages of society, we got these great returns. I mean, I personally would say, yeah, people, people, you know, in 1850, they were really benefiting from more stuff. And so there's quite a, 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 a political coalition form and this is the thing I, I would say it's it's less about the idea than contemplating it in a lot of ways right? there's this idea and i would say it's a is i you know, to say go with life itself's general approach it's a bit of a contemplation of like okay this is obviously the organizing principle why isn't it the organizing principle not only of society itself but the environmental movement or the, the well-being movement kind of at the center is there's this 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 political coalition which is formed around around group people were making money industrialists were making lots of money and in, in creating corporations which had huge economic output and the average person was even though it was unequal uh even though there were, there were lots of problems along the line was getting higher and higher incomes and growing in happiness and our entire society is kind of centered around you could say psychological adjustment to the reality of living inside a society that would run around that political consensus uh and you know we got to a certain point with our our, our happiness but we're still in that consensus while the the profit and growth imperative let's call you know call it by its true name you know, the growth imperative has a lot to do with the profit imperative where we have a society where laws and lobbying are built around creating ever greater levels of profit uh, and economic growth. And that is now infringing on our ability to be happy. So at a certain point, um, the the commitment to material growth was 
well-being enhancing or the political coalition that formed to uh, structure society about around material growth was was happiness enhancing, and now it is not happiness enhancing to maintain that political coalition. We need a new coalition to be formed around a new organizing principle, and that organizing principle can, I think, just be called sustainable well-being. And I, you know, I don't mean to take ownership of it. If you look at donut economics, um, you can see it in there. Um, you could see, you know, there's been a lot of stuff about happiness in the environment. Yeah. But so we're not trying to own that term, but we're we're trying to ask why isn't it the organizing principle? What exactly? So wait a second. So one is the basic point. It's an slightly old one. So the environment. It's like look, there should just be this kind of switch, like this gished out switch. If we but part of the issue is we all want well being. That's obvious. And what's happened is well being got collapsed with material growth. The sort of good reason. What you're trying to say is that there were good reasons maybe in the past, you know, like, hey, better dentistry or, you know, all the innovation and, and you know, having, you know, not having six kids in the room, you know, and, you know, those were things that there was a reason it got collapsed. And now that the problem is that growth, the material growth machine is what's leading to actually a real risk to well-being in the future, the unsustainability. We yeah. all... We're just, just, just to finish, so what the switch is, is that we've collapsed. So when we, why we, the sustainable well-being is such a big thing is it's really trying to get people to switch their attention or uncollapse something where well-being, which is in theory what we always wanted, got collapsed with material sort of well-being or material stuff we had. And the sustainable well-being just kind of approach or idea, narrative, that's why that's in that sense radical. And then the second point you're about to come to, which I, I is kind of central to what we're doing in life itself not saying hey that's super original no people but the politics of it how how does that actually become an, a narrative and why is it attractive right now because you know we'll, i'm sure we could go talk to whether it's environmental and be like well, we said that since the 80s or we've said that since whenever what and you know we're a car we've got at least training economics or most actual academic companies would say, well, of course, that's what we were always, you know, maximizing utility over time, you know. Um, so what I want to kind of, well, maybe you want to say something more on that, but I want to really come to is like the politics of sustainable well-being. Yeah. And why, we, why we think this is both an interesting idea for both the, the climate kind of movement, quote unquote, the environmental movement, but for politicians on all sides of the spectrum, but also what, what some of the things that might involve and what concretely we're seeking to do at life itself. That's a lot of things. So let's just start with, was yeah, there anything you wanted to add? If, we could, yeah. if we could start, yeah, going back to the, because we're, we're an interesting bit about the, the, the coalition, the collapsing, right? So it's, yeah. it's very important. You know, one thing is just think about the word welfare. How well are you faring is, is, is what, it, what it basically means, right? Yeah. But when we talk about welfare, payments or just welfare policies what we think of is, is payment right just distribution of of, of money that's yeah. kind of the general association of of, of welfare and the welfare state is it, it kind of a, provides for everybody essentially economically uh it's a main the main association because that term was at a point when the collapse between wealth well-being and and money or material goods was very strong um then that's kind of connotations and the feeling of the word so we can look we can analyze it intellectually and see that isn't really what it means but what it feels like is kind of okay we're providing for everybody monetarily uh, and, and that's evidence of the collapse and um and then there's this question of well how do we how do we question that? And well-being is what's nice about well-being is that is an attempt. So in the '90s, people started to talk about well-being as kind of an addition to uh, normal policy uh, ideas, the normal conversation about what makes life worth living. There's kind of this supplementary sphere which opened up uh, in you know the kind of the nether regions of you know post thatcher post reagan capitalism yeah. health and well-being the fact that the industry a lot of times called the health and well-being industry it's kind of health is not part of well-being <laughs> yeah 
yeah exactly right there's it's kind of this you know alternative it has this this vibe of an alternative space so people needed to because there was this collapse was going on we needed to come up with another word which described the space for something else and that that space of something else has been expanding but at the same time it has a reformist win-win meek kind of connotation right and this is you know part of the issue is that the basic like you know for example welfare you know policies look totally equal income distribution uh is an example of the most controversial welfare policy of all time there's lots of issues with it right but the with just forcing income distributions to be equal because then people don't produce as much on the same other hand if we are producing if we have the total level of production society is kind of fixed the more it's spread between people the happier everybody is because like we said before this curve goes like that and if you kind of we have you know yeah yeah you have one guy over here and the next person's over here we have them both here right if you look at the, if you just do the math the, the the total happiness is always you take the total amount of money you put everybody on that same spot the curve the the total happiness is highest right and i just and, want to emphasize something maybe to listeners at this point is that we're doing a lot of discourse in i think what we might say is the almost neoliberal or economics minded mindset not because it's necessarily totally what we think but because we're trying to speak into that even in that listening even in that ironically you know e given production being all things equal and leaving aside coercion questions and so on the political side from an economic point of view redistributing income is just a sort of win-win or well no not a win-win it's an overall social win it might not be a win for everyone in society but i'm just saying so just to emphasize that but so what you're saying is like there was this collapse well-being sort of meek it's it's got this sort of aspect to it but actually what and what we're what we're trying to do is sort of use that opening and we, and there are two parts of that one is it is important it focuses on things that that were not necessarily material in well in well-being but also we could expand that sort of meek meaning of it into a much more in a positively sense radical much more uh, like much more positive but the potential impact of it into a much bigger idea of like let's refocus on well-being and can you tell me why that why would that be such a big deal like if, if I get it, well, maybe I could say I understand is the big deal is going back to our sort of like trap, either we're in like, I, you know, either I want to be, I want kind of well-being growth. If I'm in the world where being equals material stuff, then I want growth. That's not sustainable. And so I'm stuck. I, you know, either I'm unsustainable, but I'm getting happier, maybe. Or I'm like wearing the hair shirt and turning the thermostat down. It's really cold. And my well, basically, crudely, my well-being is going down you know and but we're sustainable and there's this sort of like that there's that such a gridlock that we have in the climate sustainability discussion and what we're saying is this what is and what is it that we've been what has been coming up in the well-being area that allows us to move out of like the collapse of material the what it, i mean maybe it's age oh, yeah. tell us a bit about that okay so there's a there's something and uh, i think there's there's one more background thing yeah. okay and this these go together mindfulness for example is one huge example of people oh you know and, and, and it has that issue right this, this kind of tells us where well-being is now that okay mindfulness is kind of stress management go to your so it's an ancient practice for cultivating your quality of mind which really improves people's uh you know how good it is to be alive you know people experience how good it is to be alive uh, at the same time because it's kind of hemmed in, in the, the sphere uh, that we've created for well-being, it's kind of trapped a bit in this, well, you go to your kind of your job that you don't like and you have lots of stress that you do want, right? That's that's kind of the, the, the stereotype of it or the criticism of it. So at the same time, we've discovered that actually it really works, right? So uh, the, the trick is to use that we've learned in well-being about you know, we've been a kind of accepting the system as it is and putting these little kind of buffers and hacks on top of it. Say, well, why don't we just change the whole system to allow this kind of cultivation of different qualities of mind and 
reach its full potential rather than allowing whatever cultivation of different qualities of minds can fit in the growth oriented system. Right. And, and, you know, right. that's right. Right. So something that was almost, it's like at the beginning, it's like the sticking plaster on the growth machine, you know, and well-being it's meaning even is reduced to sort of like, Hey, most of well-being is material and there's these small little extra fixes like you're stressed at work but as this grows as we see the potential of it and as we really took the meaning of the word well-being or welfare seriously it sort of would kind of like invert the whole system the the patch would sort of become well i don't know it, like it would go from being the small the, the mice on top of the elephant to the elephant and they're kind of on the mouse and what just to get that part of what you're also saying i think there's several it's why it's such a rich conversation. Part of it is just the very arrival of mindfulness, at least in the West, the collision, you know, I ain't, traditions which are very ancient, even in Christian prayer and things like that, but they're kind of mainstreaming their collision with sort of Western science or kind of merging of some aspect. We're in a moment now where compared to even 20, 30 years ago, the amount of psychology research, the amount of evidence base we have for well-being, things like mindfulness, which have this much richer potential than just some stress management, like profound potential, that's reaching a kind of critical mass, is a sense. Like it, it, of maybe it's not quite there, but there's a now a material to say, wow, what we could call like zero carbon well-being policies. You know, you know, the traditional one was we're gonna add to GBP. That's not at least until the fantasies of I don't know, <laughs> Elon Musk or someone come true, it's not zero carbon. Uh, growth that's very much not but so we growth and well-being we've suddenly got all these techniques that not just at the superficial but at a really profound level offer amazing well-being and i mean you we mentioned one is mindfulness but are there other trauma recovery of, you know trauma, another tell me, tell me a I bit mean, more there, about that. yeah well look there's there's a two percent of the population essentially uh suffers from complex trauma 20 percent as some type of trauma, which seriously affects their their experience of, of life, uh, negatively affects their, their well being, but also massively affects uh, anxiety. Um, it's kind of it's an interesting question of how do you measure well being? Because actually, people with recover from trauma experience ex say that their lives are massively better, though their their scores on you know, linear tests of well-being aren't as different as, as you uh, as you, you might like to see them be. But as far as well, look, my my whole life uh, I've been uh, with people who recover from trauma. And I'd say you know, me that's that's partially true. You know that I I had um, a, a traumatic childhood. I used to have anxiety attacks. You know, six six times a day. Uh, you know, I don't have. I haven't had an anxiety attack six years uh and you know i probably put my well-being my my well-being at a 8.5 now and i probably put it at a 7 oh, 0.5 before but i don't actually agree that it's a point better uh and so there, there's kind of this these questions we have to ask yeah. ourselves but at the same time it's really nobody nobody who 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 is around people who've recovered from from trauma says anything but they're really different people their lives are massively better right and 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 those people have quite a lot of effects in their their family their environment second order effect um such that if you can imagine every person in your life kind of really can't listen you kind of say one thing and Nobody, you know, it doesn't really feel like you're ever really heard. And it always kind of feels like they're responding to somebody else. Uh, and they tend to be extremely reactive uh, and spread reactivity around them, right? If you have somebody who that really, really describes, that person probably is suffering from some level of trauma. And if you imagine what your life would be like if, say, half of those people uh had their symptoms be half severe or go away you know what Which would it be like for them, i mean i think there's also like there's the a study i mean felitti's data on the impact of 
and you know severe quite severe trauma in childhood and was suicide you know can i mean it's not just yeah, on the health yeah. so I, but what i'm trying to say is you're just saying is the number what, what you're saying so one was you mentioned mindfulness the other is saying trauma these these are zero carb you know i mean okay there's a cost of psychotherapy or trauma treatment but it's not this is not a new porsche what we're talking about is and it's things that we could do for each other uh and we you don't have to travel very much you know i mean maybe ideally i, I would think like some some countryside uh, retreat centers where people could go to for the initial period. People have very severe uh, trauma. They might want to spend some time and, and a kind of deep dive in trauma recovery uh, after getting started with a, a, a psychologist close to home. If you had a, a program like that. But, um, exactly. And, and also the time people spend, I mean, like, if we're talking about actually maybe doing less in other areas of our life, you know, in the material growth. But just to say, we've got a couple examples so of, of these sustainable well-being, what we could call within that sustainable well-being policy with these kind of zero carbon, high well-being examples, which are coming up in the being area of human beings, not the, the kind of having area, but the yeah. being area. So mindfulness, trauma, which you said, it we now have good morality i mean another and this this can give us another so we we we're, we're doing something this year called mindfulness based philosophical inquiry uh and also working on that with uh um, david keller and moral imagination uh on essentially work of well how do we connect to our our moral sense through inquiry and imagination okay a public program or inquiry, so we're not telling people what rules to follow, would say like, well, investigate yourself. Uh, and looking at, looking at what science can teach us about our interconnection, and really getting people to inquire to how separate their lives are from those of, of the people around them. It's another example of, uh, of uh, awakening your moral imagination, your, your moral sense, um, getting a sense of service, which is probably really amazing in terms of its uh, its benefits and well being. People who who get into service vastly increase their well being. Another example of by service, what what you mean is serving, contributing to others, being contributing to others. Yeah. yeah, helping doing doing public service is a, is a massive boon to people's well being. Um, but uh, so what, programs what, to to awaken that sense powerfully could could what, what what was the question? No, no, no. Keep going. So, so that's that's the third one, which is things that could awaken people's moral sense, their sense of purpose for themselves, them discovering. So this kind of inquiry leading also potentially into service, which is we again have now substantial evidence on its benefits for people's uh, well being. And just just to say. The, 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 the things we're talking about here, maybe for people listening, I mean, we should check the data, but we're talking about things which are really on the order of magnitude of thousands or tens of that, you know, you know, a $10,000 increase in GDP would be equivalent, you know, like, you yeah. know, really level, you know, th these are really significant impacts. Um, a doubling of GDP in some cases, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit like, like, you know, really if, if GDP doubled, uh, and everybody did mindfulness. I'm not sure how far apart those because you know we're at the point of the curve we are right now. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so, are there any other examples? I'm just saying we can come back. But other examples we've thought about that 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 you might that you might share of like kind of the zero zero growth high well being policy. Yeah, zero, sure. Sorry, zero zero kind of material growth or zero and anything that protects uh, community. I mean, this is get back to another example looking considering something on the order of rent control or just policies that help people stay put in an urban area so make it make it harder for uh neighborhoods with changes in, in changes in, in price which are dramatic over a short period of time however we do that and this is a, a point the point is not oh we have to do that they don't have any negative consequences yes but but what we're talking about, some of the inner stuff we're talking about is, is it seems a little bit more consequence-free. As soon as you get into the stuff yeah. like rent control, 
it gets super controversial, but I think it's it's part of the the discussion of the ethos of a, of a movement that really is going to talk to the center of society is that we're not just oh rent control we can't that's too much you know yes we have to take those yeah. totally seriously right and we can't be just in this what i call like i sometimes think the trivial and economy is called parade improvement but like win-win for everybody because it, yeah. it puts you in a corner where there's very few, there are some policies, but like even trauma recovery, someone pays for it, there's a cost, quote unquote, or someone has for energy. I, and I think let's just go to that. And I think the point you're saying about rain control is in one version of that story of the past, it was sort of almost a kind of, uh, you know, not like kind of the people versus the, the, the capitalists or something like, you know, like it was a rent control was like, oh, it's about equal money distribution. I think the very framing is an example of the sustainable well being. Saying, listen, you know, there might be ways, but the reason we're interested in rent control, we're interested more fundamentally in preserving community and urban community. And that's why we're interested in rent control. We're not, we're not trying to redistribute you money so much. We're not trying to restrict people making money per se, but we're interested in this and that because of its deep relationship to well-being. And then just to go on about that, because that was just one an example I think was great. You're giving a very concrete one. Maybe it's controversial, but the thing was, there's so many things that come out of community there's a lot of evidence we now have over the last 50 60 years of the impact on health i mean there's the famous rosito study in pennsylvania that we could talk about at length but there's a lot of stuff um you know there's obviously famously but putman's bowling alone other things yeah. we're really documenting this evidence and so that's another rich area we could mine for sustainable well-being policies things that enhance or sustain or support community and community and human relationships essentially work from home laws another example right reduce travel also allow people to live where they want if people are are have you know are telecommuting over long distances where are they going to live they're going to live basically near to the people they want to live around what's going to form a community how much traveling is that doing none right so you know, and, 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 and negative, negative carbon, high well being. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's another, another example. And so, uh, those, which obviously is a great thing to be doing right after lockdown, and basically the environmental movement, uh, and, and people who support the sustainable well being principle, the organizing principle of society should be getting their name on work from home laws right now um because look it, it's it's the right thing to do uh we made all these advances we want to lock those in they will allow people to live where they they want to live uh or be, be, to form community stable communities over time so okay so just to come back here i mean we could go we could talk a, a longer about that but i want to give us is the politics of it so i think one point is like you know I, you know, we sort of say here, life itself, or like ideas of cheap implementation is costing. I think I want to emphasize and ask you a bit is that our thing about sustainable well being is particularly out of almost a political strategy point. It's not saying, oh my God, this is such an innovative idea. It's sort of, but it's partly the presentation of this. And also, I think to say we're not always talking about it right now. I mean, we're sort of talking about being ready. What we, we, we sort of describe is getting to where the puck is, is going. Um, for example, some of the things we discussed right now, you know, may not, no one's maybe going to pass, like, we're going to give trauma treatment, we're going to do national scale, like, trauma treatment for everyone. We don't know, we at least, we don't know of a country, at least, you know, currently doing that. But what we're saying is, we, I mean, I want to come into the political aspect of this. So we've already talked about that it can really change the framing of us more to a win-win. We can have well-being, and we can have uh, zero carbon, or we can decarbonize. But you're now but coming to that point, the aim also of this is to sort of have wise policies, a policy framework, a policy vision ready for what we think is, even if it's maybe not now, quite potentially quite soon, significant shifts in the political landscape as the climate crisis deepens. So could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, exactly. The political so, strategy here. Exactly. So, so I mean, the, the idea is kind of like, look, it is the organizing principle. We haven't, we're not quite there yet as far as embracing it how are we going to plan for the point right now what's happening is, is people basically most people have not fully internalized they don't have a 
felt sense of just how severe uh, the climate crisis is going to be, what type of challenges it enables. And, and that is understandable because you're a small individual. We all are you know, millions and millions of people in your society. And it kind of takes a whole world of billions of people to do something substantive about climate change. There's a lot of resistance to letting in the difficulty of the issue. So people aren't doing it right now. And because they're not doing it, they're not really willing to put their backs into supporting political efforts that would really try to push this principle or the organizing principle or the specific policies that they like that come out of the principle into the center of the political debate. We know that that's, you know, that's a, an issue. On the other hand, for people who, kind, who, who, who see what we're talking about, there's a lot to be optimistic about because that Overton window, the window of of possibility, the, the the window of what is broachable in the public forum is, is constantly moving, right? Why is it constantly moving? Because weather is getting more extreme. Every time there's a new record for a forest fire, every time the North Pole gets you know to the smallest extent it ever has gotten to, kind of every year, every year the hurricane season is worse. Every year there's a new drought. Um, and so on. Every year there's record flood somewhere like in Germany uh, last year. A new group of people, a new country kind of suddenly wakes up to the severity of climate change. In Germany has uh, quite a bit this year, right? And um, so that Overton window is going in one direction as far as the ability to embrace radical change. And to say something also about that, I think that's very important. I, I, what I want to say just with me at this point is that we, really I find this is people who, well, we kind of now understand that humans tend to project a bit linearly into the future. We have different, I mean, people go on about this in technology that we underestimate the speed of technology or S-curve adoption. And it's also true in political things political change doesn't tend to happen like for a long time you know and i mentioned this discussion because sometimes when we brought up sustainable well-being particularly with well-informed people they'll be like oh but this is what we talked about in the 90s or you know the this green party and we're like yes and that's we're not claiming per se the these ideas although some aspects of what we talked about like the well-being the being part of the well-being has become much more visible and prominent and what's clearer the material problems but it's that Basically, it's like avalanches. There's going to be a small, small thing that's going to look for a long time like, my God, why are we not doing anything? And, it, and that is a big problem. But there's also going to be a moment when actually very sudden shifts happen. When, and, and, and particularly in, because of the way humans form opinions, <laughs> which yeah, is we're influenced by neighbors, point, there's right, going to the be neighbors. a kind of tipping point that's going to be quite sudden. And one of the we 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 imagine and we certainly hope around action around climate crisis, and that is quite unpredictable. It may be quite soon. I mean, you might not be. We don't know, but it may well be in the next decade at the rate things are going and what you see in public opinion, what you see, it's just aging. Like the attitudes of like twenty five year olds compared to thirty five year olds compared to forty five year olds, and those people are going to be five ten years older. I mean, look at Bernie Sanders, and you know, I mean, who who thought in 2008, we were going to have a black president of the United States, and, and then uh, a so somebody calls himself a socialist, but, you know, uh, eight years later, being a very serious candidate. I mean, the idea in 19, if you told anybody in 1988 or 1992, for that matter, or 1996, for that matter, that somebody who, who was a declared socialist was going to be a serious presidential candidate, 2016, they would have thought you were nuts. You know, as a matter of fact, I know they would have thought because I, I, I had that conversation, right? Right. And, and so what we, we're saying here, when you talk about this Overton window, if people are not familiar, which is the, the space of what's kind of considered even acceptable in ideas, just in the way that you gave a good example, for a period in the United States, being a socialist was just outside the Overton window. It was outside the window of political acceptability, um, you know, uh, I mean, another one is Angela Davis. I mean, I think, you know, some of the people, a woman who was, you know, made, major for, you know, influence considered, you know, in things, some of the things now. So what we're saying, though, is also that even if these policies right now seem a bit like, oh, wow, you know, that, that's never going to happen, you know, except in Germany, rent control never happened, you know, 
the things could move very quickly in terms of attitudes. And the point is that these are policies that are hopeful policies as well. They're not simply just moving in the direction of like, oh my God, we're all going to have to have no heating. They're, 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 these are things that as we move into the center are both optimistic for the future, plausible, but, but really have a potentially mass appeal. So there's an aspect of what you're saying is the political strategy is this is something that the window is starting to open for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we can shift it. So part of the thing is that as we mentioned, if there's right. nothing, if there's no hope of getting together a coalition and, there, and life isn't better, then it, it's actually harder to accept climate reality. And accepting climate reality is right. part of, is the, is the, is what's shifting the Overton window. So actually having the plan in place for when people accept that the severity of the situation actually moves forward the, probably very likely the date at which they accept the situation, right? So the, the more we have a plan in place, the more people are willing to actually consider the fact that we need to have a plan, right? Right. right. And right. That, it's, it's, if I tell you there's a fire, but there's no lifeboat on the ship, kind of like you, you're kind of more likely to just not think there's a fire, you know? <laughs> like if we, there's there's this aspect that if we're giving people, so I, that's very important and a little bit subtle of a systems feedback type point where, there's both, we need something when people see, more enough people see the reality to really support real political action and that very existence of a kind of, and not just kind of the green growth, slightly like, oh, right, well, we can have our cake and eat it. You know, we're just gonna keep consuming electricity, doing all this stuff and it's all gonna be fine, which doesn't, but you need a narrative that's really plausible, helps actually people accept it. And both on the kind of, the, the 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 maybe the more tough doomer side and on the more optimist side on both parties both that's another point maybe to come to is that you mentioned right at the beginning that even for the environmental movement this kind of lack it, it's often been a bit of a hair shirt narrative or oh absolutely i mean i could share a story i mean you know part of my real reason for being interested in this i i, I was always interested in activism i used to go to rallies and I would look at these people, you know, kind of like kind of hunched and angry and say, like, look, the number one issue that we have here is people don't look at people who show up to rallies and want to be like that. You know, if, if you're kind of like angry and, 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 and bitter as an activist, do people want to share the ideas? Kind of attitude that we and have. We, we've awareness. all been angry and bitter as activists as well. So we're talking about ourselves here, just to be clear. Yeah. 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 Well, this is, a, well, that's a, I was, you know, at that point, I was, I was kind of, and I found it myself and I wanted to move away from it, you know, and, and I, I, I looked at the, the more people got into it, the more something that was already in, in me that was just kind of dissatisfied and bitter seemed to get, to get, be in. The, the process was amplified, and I looked at it and felt from the other side, well, this is the other re the reason why so many people aren't interested in joining us. So they look at all of us uh, and say, well, I don't want to do that. You know, and, and it's true. So holding, holding awareness of where we are with race is, I mean, that's the, the well-being task for activists, but it's increasing the well-being task for society. So I'm, revisit that point right to the point of the overton window addressing climate anxiety right look a couple of years ago when you, when people went to psychologists they said that they're they're up at night because they're worrying about climate the psychologist said well you know it was trying to figure out what this is really about off a lot of people have stories about you know climate, activists going to the to the, the psychologist and and and, and asking this. And nowadays, there's a lot of times they go and some the psychologist says, yeah, me too. Uh, you know, that they themselves are, and there's a whole a whole organization called the Climate Psychology Alliance, which, which deals with this stuff, right? A, I think one of the major pieces right now for um, sustainable well being is being well with our sustainability challenge and and 
really addressing the public health crisis, the, the mental health crisis around climate anxiety. It's now gotten to a point where it's an undeniable fact of contemporary life that this is here. A lot of people are suffering from it and it, and it calls for tax dollars that those people pay to be used in some way which addresses that reality of contemporary life. And if that contemporary life is addressed, uh, my bet is that you have a lot more enrolled people in making a sustainable, well society. Uh, because once yeah. they get over their anxiety, their their the tendency. This is the 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 past of most of the heads of extinction rebellion and the heads of more moderate uh, climate movements. So, so um, yeah, so to emphasize, there's basically this kind of positive feedback loop. Also, in this the political strategy. Why we think that the politics of of sustainable well being is so interesting and attractive is not only does it pull forward the Overton window so so not only is it there when the Overton window moves forward it itself pulls forward the Overton window and now in at least in several senses one it provides a kind of a, a, a vision of hope of like something we can do that will both will be will be happier and weller and will have a, a a sustainable economic social system and the other point is you're saying that given the amount of stress that the climate the unaddressed climate crisis also kind of there's a kind of those people who also the activists sometimes at the forefront or the wider society that's starting to feel that anxious anxiety this almost helps their their well-being which in turn helps them really see react kind of see the reality be with it this deep mm -hmm. problem of being able to acknowledge what's really happening the true uh gravity of it without it overwhelming us which it can so easily do and without it being like oh it's all going to be fine it may not be fine and it's without it also without that like either repression the suppression repression uh kind of ignoring it or the kind of the the, the catastrophizing of it yeah. so so to kind of wrap up on 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 here a little bit i mean first i want to check is there anything you more you want to add on any of these points we haven't covered and then maybe we can kind of wrap up of like the key takeaways for us well, i think the main thing is the one thing we haven't covered is so you know why when we go back to the old coalitions the old ways of being you know what are we running into what is our conditioning another thing that we've run into when we get into this inner inner the inner work right is is secularity and to get to this last point when we're dealing with existential uh questions it, it, and, and this is just something that we, we have to kind of navigate mindfulness was was hard to Broach as a subject because it sounds like religion. Okay, well, you know, look, mindfulness, meditation, all of that stuff is kind of like it's about your uh, It's about about um, working with your your basic state of being, and that is not generally being considered a public space. Uh, it used to be the kind of secularity with this, this inner kind of community space, and then there's the government space. Um, and what's kind of happened is we, we there was a public space though for being because everybody was Catholic uh, or everybody was Protestant, but whatever it was, at least there was a public or they were split Catholic and split Protestant. But people at least had a public space. That they, pretty large that they were part of, which was a being space. And right now what's kind of happened is there is no public being space for a lot of people that they fit into. There's just kind of a secular society that they're part of and then their private life. Um, and I think we need to be, as, as people being activists or, or approaching the subject, to, to realize that that's part of the cultural um, baggage history that we're dealing with is that there's a very particular resistance to uh, the state or the government being involved in questions of being. But we're, we're starting to find a way of, of dealing with that in these questions around, around mindfulness, uh, around trauma relief, around, you know, around, I'd say, the deep adaptation or the adaptation climate future will get us there more. But I think that's really sort of a, a, a 
a call, an open call for people to have more conversation about that in, in our you know, future work. It's like, well, how do we, how do we reopen that, that, that question of how to organize a public being state uh, that can maybe make up for the ones that have fallen ways? Yeah, great. I mean, really, yeah, really great. Okay. Well, so what's so our kind of takeaway is we said what sustainable well being is, which is what it says on the tin, a sustainable, like sustainable. So, certainly in that case, a zero carbon uh, approach, but in broader than that, but focused on well being. And so, and, and particularly what's crucial of well being beyond material growth, like de, uh, you know, uncollapsing the material part that can contribute to that from the, the non material. Uh, part and the, the I think also just want to answer this here before there can be a long way up the curve but the point that really kicks in can be really pretty low down the uh, the the consumption curve in terms of uh, in terms of that um, we can come back to that maybe in a subsequent episode in some of our material online which you can you can find um, secondly you were saying that, that what we're interested in particularly here is the politics and the the reason that this is coming to the fore, which is several converging factors. The, the movement down, the, 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 the fact that some countries are now so well off, there's very little being done, yet they're causing most of the carbon emissions, yet they're getting very little for material growth uh, in, in even the most optimistic estimate, ex estimates. I mean, some people think it would actually be negative for well-being, but you know, the material growth, um, <laughs> even directly. But the most optimistic, secondly, uh, the growth in the well-being evidence and the being part of it, the stuff that isn't material related in the last, certainly accelerated last 20, 30 years, obviously over thousands of years, but in, in terms of the scientific and, and kind of presence in society. Secondly, obviously the growing climate crisis, which means that the Overton window is really shipping and shipping, shifting more rapidly and will be sort of avalanche-like. It won't be continuous. It will keep moving and then suddenly there'll be a majority or a, like the, the, the number of people, there'll be a kind of uh, aspect of that. Mm -hmm. And so finally, uh, what we're, we're saying is that we're sort of creating a set of, to, to end one of the aspects of the efforts of life itself is both putting this idea why it's time has come or coming very soon, but also this menu of policies to have ready for policymakers who are interested in this, who see this narrative and I'd say, okay, well, give me some, sustainable well-being policies policies particularly which are high well-being low zero or even negative uh, kind of carbon impact what can you show me and that's one of the things that we've been doing uh, with our collaborators collaborators in the wiser policy yeah and, and to build an overall ethos right where we're going towards this we have the plan for the future we're working on some stuff right now but there's kind of the now things that we could be doing you know, we could be be doing more with trauma recovery right now. Uh, we could be doing more with work at home right now. But it's just some of the things we mentioned have to go back, but for the, there's mm -hmm. stuff that can be delivered now as part of a movement that has a, an overall plan to take us to a, a transition to a, a well earned society. Yes. Right? And, and to really build that narrative and that feeling of like there is a movement towards this and to put policies that people like and people are going to experience that we can get past so that people can experience them as good policies so that help to move forward with the adoption rate. So yeah. How can we start with how do we get that, you know, the adoption curve? How do we get the positive impact of those policies tied to an overall ethos of sustainable well-being that so such that as the you know the evidence accumulates that we need a radical shift people look to the sustainable well-being policies when they decide that shift is necessary right it's necessary. to some extent already introduced itself at the answer right so that's where, that's where we're at and climate anxiety for example right now <laughs> a big way to of uh, of pushing that, that yeah. forward. So, and to wrap up, if people are interested and in finding out more or participating in this work or whatever, go to uh, just search for Life Itself Sustainable Wellbeing or go to Life Itself 
uh, point US slash sustainable dash well-being, all one word on the well-being. And uh, yeah, we look forward to future episodes. If you want to also find out more about you know, sign up for more, just sign up to our newsletter, just go to lifeitself.us and your slash newsletter. All the very best. Like the, also, give a, a short sh shout out to uh, David Dekel, uh, Jamie Bristow, and Rupert Reed for a useful conversation about this subject. Um, and Jeff Mulgan and all of yeah, the other Jeff Mulgan as well, yeah. uh, participants we've had on the Wiser Policy Forum. Yeah, we should, a full list is on some of the blog posts and the paper that we're going to be releasing. So yeah, we, we, uh, we apologize if we've missed anyone out there, but there are lots of people who've been contributing in conversations with us. And obviously the huge, there's a huge background of the idea that's nothing to do in any way with life itself that we are simply standing on the shoulders of. So yeah, all, all great acknowledgements. Thank you very much, Liam, for your time today. And we look forward to further conversations. Yeah, thank you, Rufus. <laughs>